The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Hi, I'm Priscilla um, Christelson. Uh, ECAT is uh, today uh, filming this program and it is being held at the Council on Aging and it is called uh, Brain Health. Is it? Six pillars of brain health. Six pillars. Not five, but six. Only six. Okay, that's a, probably enough for us to uh, apprehend six. Maybe seven might be a different health journey. <laughs> okay. So, Sam uh, uh, Doknovich, is that right? That's correct. Sam Doknovich, he is, uh, he retired in uh, October of 2019 <coughs> after career at IBM and Siemens Building Technologies. So he, he's obviously much more mm -hmm. tech savvy than most of us here. Uh, and he was in the services and security fields. Um, I'm going to read the rest of this. One of the aspects of his professional life that he found most fulfilling was the development of training programs and materials used in branches across the United States. In 2020, Sam was appointed to the Hopkinton Council on Aging Board. He parlayed his interest in training uh, and personal development to oversee the local implementation of the national age-friendly um, uh, and dementia-friendly community initiative through the Hopkinton Council on Aging. The initiative's goal is to make communities safer and more nurturing places to live for seniors, people with dementia, their loved ones, and their caregivers. Sam became certified as a Dementia Friends Champion in 2021. Joining the AARP Speakers Bureau was a natural extension of his work with this initiative and involvement with the Hopkinton Senior Center in addition to his volunteer work, Sam loves home repair projects. Boy, could he use some of those? <laughs> I'm already fully booked at both my kids' house. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, photography, hiking the 48, 4,000 foot peaks in New Hampshire, oh my God. and time with his very first grandchild. Congratulations, Sam. Thank you for coming and presenting. And thank you. And we're going to really enjoy your presentation. It's always though, the worst thing is to hear somebody talk about you, <laughs> right? It makes me sound so good. Now I have to be extra intelligent during this presentation. So uh, yeah, thank you for having me here today. I'm really looking forward. This is more of a facilitation rather than me just presenting. There's gonna be a lot of time to share and ask questions. So we wanna make this as interactive as possible. As Priscilla said, I am a volunteer. I don't get paid for this. Um, I'm an expert in presenting the materials. And in fact, this presentation corresponds and correlates really closely with what I'm already engaged in with the Hopkinton Council on Aging, getting Hopkinton certified as an age-friendly, dementia-friendly community. So the six pillars of brain health is uh, uh, what we talk about and how to keep your brain healthy and keep your body healthy. So I'm looking forward to uh, today's presentation <coughs> with you. Before we get into the, the, into the presentation, I'd like just a couple people to say, why did you come today besides to enjoy the air conditioning and have free coffee? Mm -hmm. Why are you here? And a couple people want to share what they hope to get out of this? It just sounded very interesting. Why? Because the brain is everything. The brain is everything, what yes. What am I without my brain? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I've been diagnosed with mild retrieval issue. Okay. So that's why I'm here. Okay. We're going to learn a little bit about that and how you can keep your brain healthy. And as I was talking with some of you before, brain and body are so inter interlinked that it's hard to separate what keeps the brain healthy, also keeps the body healthy. So that's really good. Um, there are some handouts on the side. We're not going to really reference those during the presentation, but please take a set with you. But one of the ones that I really like is um, it's a double-sided. It's a resource list. So there's a ton of good resources that are available on the AARP site and other sites that you might want to access. Because um, today, hopefully, this is the start of your journey into making your, your brain healthier, uh, not the end of your journey. So first, we have to go through the mandatory disclaimer. So I will, I, I have to be, I'm, I'm forced to read this to you, but that's part of the AARP uh, uh, 
process. This session is intended to be informational and educational and does not constitute medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. As with any set of recommendations, you should first always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified healthcare provider for diagnosis and treatment of your specific medical needs. For questions regarding personal health or medical conditions and before beginning or changing any treatment activity program or dietary plan. AARP is not responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken reliance upon or as a result of the information provided during today's session. So, if you go home and tell your significant other that Sam told you in the presentation <laughs> that eating fried chicken and hot fudge sundaes is the and having bourbon on the side and then smoking a big cigar is the best thing you could possibly do, <laughs> we know that's false. You can't blame me for what happens next. So first, let's start with some good news. Until recently, the standard medical view was you have the brain that you had when you were young. Your brain ages, cells die, and your brain loses productivity, and you have some cognitive issues as you get older. Lately, research has shown that the brain can really regenerate itself. It can develop new synapses, new neurons, new connections, new ways to keep your brain healthy. And that's really good news, because before it was like, well, I had the brain I was gonna have when I was born, that's all I have, and I can't do anything to impact the brain's ability to stay healthy and then control my body and, and, and uh, contribute to a really productive and wonderful life. But now they found that um, about 30% of physical aging can be related to your genetic composition, but 70% of that is under your control. And that's really good news. Well, is it good news or is it bad news? Because it means it's under your control. So that means if you do eat fried chicken, hot fudge sundaes, drink too much bourbon, smoke too many cigars, you're hurting yourself. So hopefully today you'll learn some tips on what you can do to maintain good brain health. So what are we going to talk about? Well, we got the six pillars of brain health. Be social. We know how important it is to stay socially engaged with friends and family. We know what happened during the pandemic, right? You know, people were isolated and it impacted everybody. It impacted seniors. It impacted kids who couldn't go to school. And I see some of you already starting to take notes. If you want to get a copy of these slides, make sure that Megan has your email address because I will send a PDF of these slides to Joe and Megan, and then they can distribute them out. So, but we know how important it is to be social. Engaging your brain is really important. You have to learn new things. And we're gonna go obviously into each one of these in more detail. Managing stress. Stress is a killer. It impacts your brain and it impacts your body. As any of you who have been through stressful periods in your life know. I mean, I know my daughter, when she has a stressful time with her child, her husband, her job, she gets sick almost immediately. The brain stress contributes to bodily discomfort. We know how important ongoing exercise is, and we're going to give you some tips on exercise. You know, exercising doesn't mean you have to run a marathon every day, but you do have to keep moving. Restorative sleep. It's really important to get a good night's sleep, and we're going to go over some tips on how to, uh, how to have a good night's sleep. And then the last one, eating right. Eating right is really important. Um, we all like our, our bad foods. Everyone has the red flag foods in our house. It is cookies. So when I buy cookies, and I like my occasional cookie, they get hidden. I buy double stuffed Oreos. I buy um, pinwheels, which are marshmallow. Well, people, people are shaking their heads up and down. And they, I, I don't leave them out. Sugar wafers, they're hidden in the secret part of my house that my wife doesn't know. And then when she says... Can I have or a double stuff or I said, how many would you like? And I saw two or three. And then I go get them from the secret place, which she has not discovered. Because if I leave them in the cabinet, guess what happens? So we all have these kind of problem foods. So hopefully we'll give you some tips on how to uh, stay healthy. So first of all, why is brain health so important today? Well, we're adding life to years, right? People are living longer. It was really interesting when I looked at the stats. A hundred years ago, so a hundred years ago would be 1923, the average life expectancy for a man was 56.1 years. 
And for a woman, 58.5. Women always live longer than men. Yeah. We know why. Because they drive us. <clears throat> but we won't say that up here. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'll be in really big trouble. I'm only joking. I've been married 42 wonderful years, so my wife is great. And I'm going to actually incorporate some of her tips in this, today's uh, presentation. But by 2023, the average life expectancy for a man has increased to 81.6 years. Wow. And more than 22 years for a woman to 85 years. So we're living longer. You know, my father-in-law always said, I never want to live longer than my money. You know, if you have that graph, you know, your age and your money, you want to make sure you don't reach zero and your money while you're still alive. Bless you. The same thing, though, with your, with your body and your brain. You don't want to reach the end of life and not have quality of life. So people are living longer. I mean, they're rethinking retirement. You know, many people are continuing to work part-time engaging in new careers. I'm doing all these activities in retirement that I really enjoy. I really enjoy coming out and meeting people and facilitating this discussion and bringing some information. It's, uh, it's really a high point of my retirement. I did a lot of training when I was in my corporate career, both for IBM and Siemens. I taught classes across the United States. So I really like teaching. In fact, I think uh, coming up in the fall, I'm gonna sign up to be a substitute teacher in one of our school systems. The other issue is skyrocketing healthcare costs. So one of the challenges, you live older, you're gonna pay healthcare insurance for a longer period of time, and then they always have deductibles and co-pays, and so it's gonna cost us much more to live. And then, like I said, this current brain research that shows that you can impact your brain and your body and make it better. So that's why brain health is so much more important today than it was when everyone passed in the 50s which I thought that was pretty startling. So the first pillar of brain health is to be social. You know, studies have shown that people who are social live longer. They're mentally uh, happier. They're physically more capable. So let's get into some of the details. So it's really important to stay engaged with friends, family, and communities. A study that was done in 2020 by the National Academies of Sciences showed that Social isolation increases the risk of dementia by 50%. Why? Because when you're interacting, one of the common themes you're going to hear through this presentation is when you're engaging the brain, when you're learning new things, you're creating new synapses, new neurons, new brain connections. So when you're isolated in your house, not doing any of that, guess what happens to the ability of the brain to repair itself? It decreases. And that increases the risk of dementia by 50%. That's pretty startling. So we have to stay engaged with friends, family, and community. We know how hard that is. I know you have a, a good senior center here, a good senior services organization that offers a lot of programs. Uh, we were talking uh, about bringing more guys into the senior center. We have the same issue in Hockington because I'm on the board for the Council on Aging, and we're working to broaden our programs and make it more of a community center, get that word senior out, because what you said is what many people say, I don't want to be thought of as a senior. Well, we are seniors, but we don't want to be thought of it. So, and you got to avoid isolation. So before we get into some tips on how to stay more socially engaged, what do you guys do to stay socially engaged? I'm going to use guys as the, the, the request for everybody. What do you do to stay socially engaged? take different courses, but some of them are closed from the pandemic, Yep. and they don't want the seniors back. Courses where? Because silence speaks for itself. I don't have to call you and ask you yeah. if I'm not wanted. I already know. Yeah, I hear you. Well, where do you take courses? Uh, Master Soyet, I used to take it at Wheaton College. Okay. They start the programs. Do you think they're going to start it up again sometime? No, I don't. Okay. And I personally don't give a damn. Okay. Well, I can't help you with that. But what? Any other ways that you stay socially engaged? Yeah, we live in an over fifty-five community, which is very socially active. Uh, in fact, we had a pool party yesterday with sixty people. Okay. And that's great. Yeah. Church. Church. Church is another one. Are you involved in any committees or organizations at church? Yes, the Green Team. What does the Green Team do? Uh, the Green Team uh, advises the church for environmentally uh, important. Uh, things we can do. So we no longer use paper plates. We use uh, china, silverware, that kind of thing. Um, and um, we're hoping that it ripples out to the membership. 
and, uh, and, and then we're going to, once we get taken care of our own house, we hopefully will ripple out to the community. What the church do you go to? Holy Trinity Lutheran. Oh. Any other tips on how you stay socially engaged? Which now it's, the pandemic is over. COVID's still here, but the yeah. pandemic is over and there are more opportunities to do programs that we couldn't do before. Any other tips that you found really helpful in your, in your recent years? Morning coffee with a group of friends. Uh, how did that start? I don't know. They, a group used to go to Stonehill for mass. They all worked at Stonehill. You know, and then when they retired, they went to mass and then they both caught the after after they had their church. And I was invited one time and I just loved it and I continued going. And they go five days a week. Yep. And my father-in-law, before he passed, he was involved in something like that. Every day they met at seven o'clock at some McDonald's somewhere and the guys all sat around, had coffee and chatted for an hour or two. And they went through separate ways and enjoyed their day. So you could start that on your own, right? We all have friends. Start with a group of two. One of the things you're gonna hear over and over in this is that we are in control of our own destiny. So if you wanna get something done, don't wait for somebody else to do it. There's no programs at that organization you mentioned. Maybe there's programs somewhere else that you can join. Yeah, was it so take charge. As a we frequently say that it's therapeutic. <laughs> Because we, we all bring our problems in the morning and we, we solve them for each other. And it is a therapeutic group. It really is, right. And maybe if you don't solve them, just talking about them and realizing that other people have the same problems as you have, so you don't feel so isolated. Mm -hmm. So we we'll find that the human experience generates common problems for everyone who's on this journey. Mm -hmm. So one more. I go shopping and I socialize. And I get a high. <laughs> From the shopping or the socialization both. or both? Both. And you're stimulating the economy. <laughs> we, lo we love that. We love that. Uh, yeah. I would not, well, you know, you got to go shopping, but keep it within your budget. Well, that's what my husband says. Yes, you know, yes. Us husbands, we kind of went to the husband school and we say the same things all the time. So, one I more. I babysit. Babysit. And I end up going to sports events with... Uh, Bunches of people. And you meet new people? Yes. And you have fun? Sporting events could be outside in the good weather for soccer. Oh, usually there. Inside. Games and, yeah. and whatnot. Great. Well, let's see what AARP in, uh, has on their slide. Get involved. Join a club or participate in sports. I, I started playing pickleball. Anyone here play pickleball? It's a really fun sport. You don't have to be a super athlete to play pickleball. It's on a much smaller <laughs> court than tennis. It's like you can put a pickleball court on each side of the tennis court. Um, I joined a book club at the uh, senior center. Do you have a book club at this senior center? Yes. yes. Book clubs are great. You read a great story. You get together. You socialize. You talk about the book. You talk about your life. Attend community events. Um, do you have community community events at your library? Maybe. Do you have a, any type of arts alliance or cultural center in Easton? No. No? We need it. It's very difficult well, sound. Hoppington has a Hoppington Community, uh, Hoppington Center for the Arts, so they have programs too. Okay. Do you have another one for yourself? Uh, yes, it's a um, probably 10 years old, the Easton Shoveltown Cultural District. What is it? The Easton Shoveltown Cultural District. I'm on the board of directors. Uh, we just planned uh, seven concerts, free concerts. We get grants to so everybody can come and enjoy. Um, they're on Wednesday nights. Uh, the first one, I think, is July 12th, or maybe, yeah. I think it's July 12th. Yes, July, July 12th, 5th. July 19th, and can continue it's on. It's July and 5th at the library, the Sharon Community Yes, and then at the library right. also on Wednesdays, um, earlier, an hour earlier than ours. Um, but the venue is different, so the oh. music is different, attracts different people. And these are, uh, it's on the steps of the Ames, the Oaks Ames Memorial Hall. Nice. And maybe when you pass that, you've seen uh, a, a concert here tonight, you know, you'll see that, nice. or you'll see a, a schedule of, of concerts. Uh, we are, have, we have art exhibitions um, at, we're going to have one uh, at 50 Oliver Street. So you really need if, to, to keep aware of social media, for those of you who have, how many of you have computers? 
I mean, or an yeah. iPhone or an iPad yeah. or some type of smart right. device. Right, and then so just go online and Shoveltown Cultural District, write it down, Shoveltown Cultural District, and we have a website and you can, and not only uh, do, are the, uh, uh, other events sponsored by the Cultural District, but we talk about all of the events in Easton, all of them. So you can, we have a newsletter that comes out once a month and uh, you'll see everything that's going on. Everything. Where do you get the news? Huh? Where do you get the news letter from Easton? From uh, Easton it's Easton? online, it would be under... I, I'm visually impaired, so I cannot do anything at the computer, and I have problems socializing because of my internet. I see. And I, I like to have the phone number of your... Okay, I'll talk to you later. Yep, she'll get it to you later. So point of this, one of the great things about doing this type of an event, facilitating this with all these people, you're going to have a lot of good suggestions to share with everyone. That's a great one. So we have a like the voice of reason over here who will help share good suggestions that you can then engage with that you may not have known about. Consider adopting a pet or pet sitting. We, we pet sit for my wife's uh, boss when she goes away for weekends and on vacation. We have their dog. I'm not a big dog person, but it's fun to have a dog for three or four or five days and then give it back, um, especially if the dog likes to be walked like four times a day and you have other things to do. Volunteer. Does anyone here volunteer at either the senior center or at another facility? Well, AARP is always looking for other volunteers for lots of volunteer activities. So think of where you can get engaged and volunteer. And here's some uh, uh, websites, and they're all on your resource page. So they have a, a virtual volunteering list at aap.org slash virtual volunteering. They have a virtual community center. There's, there's a lot of events that you can participate on by a computer um, at AARP. And these links, you don't have to write them down. They're all on the resource list. And the one that I like a lot is Friendly Voice, which is a really cool program. So say you know somebody who's uh, pretty socially isolated. Maybe they have medical issues. They can't get out of their house. And they would, you would like somebody to call them regularly. You call the AARP Friendly Voice number and you give them the information and they will make phone calls on a regular basis to this person and say, hi, how you doing? You know, what's going on? Are you okay? It's a great program because if that person can't get out of the house, we can bring some friends into the house via the phone. Okay, I just want to uh, mention a competing Friendly Caller program. Here at the Council on Aging in East End, we have a friendly caller program too. Mm -hmm. And I am one of the friendly callers. Okay. So that's another more volunteer Woo thing that I do. <laughs> and it's funny because yesterday, one of my guys, Robert, he called me. Okay, oh. so that happens too, you know, where they get a little lonely and they want to talk to somebody. And we talk for an hour. Um, anyway, just to let you know, Council on Aging has a friendly caller. You can sign up here on your way out if you want to get calls or if you, uh, you can call in at, um, uh, the phone number here is 230-0690. Call in and say you want to be on the list, okay? Or you can call in for somebody else. Okay, be sure you get their permission, of course. And Priscilla and I will both be here after the presentation, so you can come up and ask specific questions or get specific Sorry I interfered. No, this is great. You know, the point of this is to share more information to make everyone better at keeping their brain healthy. Mm -hmm. So let's get to number two, engage your brain. So important to learn new things. So when I first started, when I first got involved with the age-friendly, dementia-friendly initiative, I was uh, reading some of the background material that, and I wasn't very, uh, my mom passed from dementia. Both my wife's parents passed from dementia. Uh, when I do my Dementia Friends Information Sessions presentations, I always say, I wish I knew then what I knew now. I would have been a care partner for my mom. But you know, you can't change the past, but maybe I can help people be more capable of taking care of their, their loved ones who might be having some type of cognitive uh, impairment. But I came across a study as a group of nuns. And they followed this group of nuns for years and years and years and years and gave them tests to gauge their cognitive level. And they noticed these, you know, these nuns had high cognitive uh, functioning all the way to the end of their life. And then when they passed, they, the nuns agreed to donate their brain, to have it dissected, to really look to see how the brain had changed. Because dementia, no matter what form it is, changes the brain physically. And they found, wow, look at these brains. If I just 
looked at this brain, I would say this person would have limited cognitive functioning or really have impaired cognitive functioning, but their level of cognitive functioning was really high. And then when they did further autopsies, they discovered that the brains of the nuns made all these new connections. They had all these new neurons. So they went back to see what were the nuns doing differently than regular people. They changed their jobs every five years. So they were in this nursing home and they worked there until they passed. But every five years, they had a completely different job. It could be running the whole center, could be a job, or running the gift shop, or running the volunteers. But they learned something new every five years. And that's the key point of this, um, this pillar, engaging your brain. You gotta challenge your brain in new ways. You can't do the same things over and over again, because when you learn something new, the brain develops new neurons and synaptic connections and grows new connections. So think of it this way. If part of your brain is deteriorating, degenerating because of some kind of cognitive issue, you can make up for that by generating more good brain cells and more neurons and more synaptic connections in other parts of it. So you got to do something new. New interest, stay curious, and challenge your thinking. Don't do the same things over and over and over again. So before we get into the AARP tips, what tips do you have on learning new things? What have you done to learn new things as we all age? And like I said to some of you before, I told my mother, she used to say, oh, another birthday's coming here. I hate birthdays. And I said, remember, Mom, when you stop having birthdays, where are you? <laughs> so birthdays are good. Aging is good. Because if we stop aging, we're... So what are you doing to learn new things? What have you done to learn new things? I went to Portugal, and so I learned a few words of Portuguese so I could talk to the people. That uh, generated a lot new connections, many new connections in your brain. Great. Any other people like to share what they've done to learn something new, to challenge their brain, to learn new things? I watch PBS. <laughs> okay, and what do you like about watching PBS? How does it challenge you? They, they have so many diversified programs on TV that uh, it enlarges your spectrum of things, whether it be travel or um, astronomy or science or a variety of things. And I enjoy, we enjoy watching it. And when you watch a show on something new, does that make you say, maybe I'll go to the library and get a book on it to read up more on it? No. Okay. So that's, that's, that's good, too. But I, I could. I could. You could? I could. I know. I, love I don't go to the library. I, I buy my books. I can't take two weeks to read a book. You buy books. See, I get all my books from the library, except if, I, if it's you a book I want to add house. to my collection. So I yeah, add to my collection. But um, I was going to comment on, I like reading historical fiction. How many people like historical fiction? Because I like the connection of a story to some real events. Yeah. But when I'm reading a book that is uh, historical fiction, I always have my iPad with near me. Because when it mentions a town, a battle, an event, I look it up. Yeah. You're shaking your head. You do something the same? Yeah, all the time. Whenever I'm reading, even the newspaper, I, I have my Googles already. And, yeah. you know, yeah. Even if I see a word I never heard of, I check it out on that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you're learning new things, right. and me you're too. using what you're reading to stimulate your curiosity, and you're going out to learn something more about that. Right. That's, that's great. Any others? Um, I do um, three different DNA um, sites, and one of them is my heritage, and it gives me a lot of information about my ancestors. And so there are names, and then I try to make connections, and I, I Google. I Google the uh, place where they come from. I Google who they are, that kind of thing. But I Google everything that I don't know. Yep. That's a lot. Yep. <laughs> yep. And so of course, you do have to be careful where you're going to get your information because there are some sites that right. aren't exactly truthful. Right. So sometimes you have to go to two sites to see if they're saying the same thing. Um, great tips. Do we have any more? Let's see what AARP recommends. Take or teach a class. I mean, I took a photography class um, 
when I first retired because I did photography back in the old days when you had negatives and film and a dark room and all that. And now it's all digital. You don't need a dark room. You need a big monitor that's color corrected and a laptop with some software on it. Um, learn a new language, Portuguese. Take dance lessons. Some of these are also good for your exercise. I mean, dancing is great exercise. Learn a new musical instrument. I always wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> I have no musical talent, so I'm not going to take up the guitar. Try complex arts and crafts. Play challenging card or board games. Anyone, did any of you build models when you were younger? I did. I built an eye. You built an eye model? Yeah. Have you built any models now that you're... No, I leave it up to my kids, but they grew out of it. Yeah, well, that happens too. Yeah, but if you build models when you were young, maybe you can start building. I did. I built some models. You know, I had a whole collection of things that I that I bought over the years that I never made. So I made three or four models when I first retired. It's a lot of fun, especially in the winter. But the important thing is to challenge yourself and do something new. That's the key point here. Don't do the same thing over and over again. Also, people typically have a question about playing brain games. Do br playing brain games, specific brain games, do, do they help uh, 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 ward off cognitive decline or any kind of degenerative process? And there's really no conclusive <coughs> evidence that shows that if you're doing the same thing over and over again. But there is evidence that shows if you're learning new things, you're going to develop new brain connections and new brain cells, which is really what we want to do to make up for all the ones that have uh, reached their age. Managing stress, boy, this is, this is um, we know that stress can be a killer, not only to the brain, but to the body. Uh, managing stress is really important. And we just came through a very stressful time, the pandemic, right? It impacted every, all of us in different ways, whether you had kids in the school system, um, whether your grandchildren had, uh, were in the school system or your kids, kids uh, they were impacted. And we know uh, jobs were impacted and we came through a very stressful time. So what are some ways that we can manage stress? Exercise is a great stress relief because if you're exercising, you can't worry about other things, right? I walk, I can't run, I have two new knees. I had new knees put in in 2017, which are really great. So I can power walk, but I can't run. But I know when I'm doing a good workout, I can't think about what's stressing me out, whether it's my kids, <laughs> the world, my finances. Smiling and laughing is so important because it releases hormones that are very beneficial. So what happens when you walk into a room and you smile at somebody? You just did it. You smiled right back. Yep, smiling and laughing is so important. And I live with a laugher. My wife laughs continuously. When she's on the phone talking with her girlfriends for six or seven hours straight. You know, they, I, I don't even know they say words because I just hear her laughing all the time. But it's so good to laugh. I mean, you guys were just laughing. It, it releases good hormones and chemicals in our body that make you just enjoy the day more. It really, it really uh, impacts our stress levels by lowering them. Distract yourself with music and reading. I like reading books rather than watching TV. I like putting music on when I'm washing the dishes. Sometimes my wife and I don't agree on the music. Also seeking out green spaces. And you don't have to do the 48, 4,000 footers, but I, in New Hampshire, to, to, to experience nature. But I tell you, I am the most calm and the most relaxed when I'm in the woods, any kind of woods, walking down the path, listening for the birds, the breezes, fighting off the bugs maybe this time of year. But that relaxes me. Get outside and enjoy nature. It's also good because your body needs to be, we're gonna get into this more on the sleep pillar, restorative sleep, but your body needs to be exposed to sunlight every day to maintain its regular bodily circadian rhythm. And also sun develops vitamin D, which is very helpful. So get outside and enjoy nature. So what are some things that you do to help manage stress? that you found very successful at managing your stress. And we all have stress in our lives. Nobody is stress-free. I don't know, I like poetry. You read poetry? Not that I understand it, but 
I'm trying, you know, I try to find meaning. And also, your mind has great power. You don't have to let anything get to you if you don't. You can have like an inner fire. Yeah, and it's tough sometimes though, right? What? It's tough sometimes though to ward off the bad thoughts and the repetitive thoughts and the things you're worried about, right? But yeah, but I have like conflicts. Like I say, what? Why did you have a weak moment? I, I mean, well, hopefully, you, when you talk to yourself, my biggest you can... enemy is myself. <clears throat> like, I read a really good book that I highly <laughs> recommend. It's called The Book of Joy. It's um, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who's no longer with us, and the Dalai Lama. They had a week-long conference that was set up by a writer. And the conference was all about how to find more joy in everyday activities, how to make washing the dishes joyful, how to make grocery shopping joyful, how to make cleaning the toilets joyful, how to make you know putting your shoes on joyful. And I. I bought it, I got it out from the library, and it was so inspirational uh, for me that I bought it, and now I'm going through it again. And I'm now, I've now, since it's my own copy, I can highlight things and write things down. But the Book of Joy, I thought it was one of the best books of that type of book, inspirational books that I've ever read. Other ways that you manage stress? Um, what's her name? That lady from the Cape, she lives in Plymouth. What's her name? The lady from the Cape. Oh, she lives in Plymouth. If you read her books, you you would. Oh. Definitely. I don't know. Oh, she's so funny. <clears throat> if you read her books, you will relieve your stress level. So reading is good. And I stress saw reliever. her in concert. Oh. It was terrific. You don't remember her name. It though. wasn't Irma Bombeck, but she's good too. Okay. Um, but Loretta LaRoche. Loretta, Loretta LaRoche. LaRoche. Yeah. She's Write that great. down. Write that down. Okay. Oh, she's so funny. She said, don't save anything. I never save. Yeah, well, that's a good You spend it all shopping. Right. So, right? <laughs> we know that now. You buy all these books. You don't get them from the library. So you know where your money's going. Any other tips for uh, managing yes. stress? Yes. I have. I rescued a dog. Oh, dog rescue. Yes. And uh, so all you need to do, and he's such a love and, and just, you know. Hug your dog, and then taking the dog for a walk or two a day, that is a great way to, and then you're out in nature, uh, and you're... And you meet your neighbors. Right, and also I think, I used to uh, walk with a neighbor, and I haven't done that recently, but uh, I think that's a very good thing to do, because you're walking, but you're socializing, you're talking, you're laughing, you're doing a lot of the things when you go for a walk with a neighbor or a friend, mm -hmm. and you can do that, you know, I had neighbors, every morning at 8 a.m., I could see them out walking, and, and they, were, they were walking into their 90s. Yeah, when we dog sit for my wife's boss, my wife will take the dog out after dinner, which now, of course, is still light, and she won't come back for like an hour and a half. I know she's not walking a whole hour and a half. What, I mean, she goes, I met so many of our neighbors who I haven't seen in months. Because we're all out walking their dogs after dinner. And it's really every, great. And everybody talks to somebody who has a dog. But you don't talk to somebody who's alone. But when you see them with a dog, somehow you know that they're friendly and they're going to be nice people. Mm, that means the axe murderers in the rooms. <laughs> they're going to go get dogs and they're going to go out with their dogs. And now they know how to, you know, convince people that they're nice and then they're going to whack you over the head. But that's true. You always assume, I always told my wife that if she passed away, I'd get a dog instantly because you meet a lot of people that way, right? Everyone loves somebody <laughs> with a dog, right? It's just like if you're a, a single. We have a, one, of my, uh, one of my nephews is single and he's 25. He said, oh, you can't find dates. And I said, get a dog. As soon as you get a dog and walk it, you know, women will come up to you and say, oh, well, that's such a nice dog. And, yeah, it's a great, it's a good chick magnet. But Any other tips on managing stress? <laughs> I, without fail, every week, make a promise to myself on Sunday night to watch America's Funniest Home Videos. <laughs> and I laugh, belly laughs to beat the band, and I laugh constantly, nonstop for an hour. All those baby things and pet things, they're hysterical. And you can hand me down the hall. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that, that is really stress reduction. Yep. And you're too. releasing all those good in, uh, hormones <laughs> and stimulating your brain. Yeah. Great. 
Let's see if there's any ones that AARP recommends. Confide in friends. We talked about that. It's really important. Even if they're on the phone, they can give you a hug on the phone. Be silent and still. Do some meditation. Take stretch breaks. If you're on the computer, I know many people get addicted to the computer and they sit there all day looking at stuff. Take breaks. Limit your screen time. Take deep breaths. Being still and quiet, though, is really important. I really like that. Um, I'm a very... I, I always call myself uh, an introverted extrovert. I'm very extroverted at certain things like doing this and in my work career, but when I'm home, I like to be quiet. I like to be read my book and reflect on the day. So let's watch a cool little film. What makes you laugh right now? My stepdaughters, but I find that they're laughing at me and not with me. Laughter, it's universal. The dictionary calls it an expression of emotion with an explosive vocal sound. But it's so much more than that. Humor and our ability to laugh add depth to our daily life. It engages various brain networks, including those that process information and search for patterns. What can you do to bring more laughter to your life? Talk with friends about fun memories. Learn to laugh at yourself. See how laughter may also be good for your brain health. So the only thing I probably wouldn't recommend there is you don't have to wear a tutu and dance around in it, but I thought that was pretty good. So pillar number four, ongoing exercise. Doesn't mean you have to be a marathon runner. You just need to move. In fact, our senior, uh, our senior center show on our local community access TV is called Keep Moving. It's all about keep moving. Remember, exercise can be a chore, but what's the alternative? What happens once you get into a sedentary routine? Die. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's very typical. You stop doing exercise, then you eat a little bit, gain a little weight. You know, that makes you, makes you less want to do exercise, and then you do less exercise, you eat a little bit more. You don't keep your body metabolism going. Think of a car. What if you had a car and you just parked it? What's the best thing to do with a car? Drive, drive it. You got to drive it to keep the fluids, get them up to temperature, keep things warm, keep things moving. Same with your body. If you don't do that, and um, we're going to get into some of the tips that AARP recommends, but how much exercise do you really need? 150 minutes of exercise a week. And this is probably one of the most important ones that you should really talk to your healthcare provider before you engage and start on any kind of exercise plan. Because sometimes people tend to overdo it in the beginning. And what happens when you overdo it in the beginning? You run your risk of injury. And then if you do get injured, what happens? You're never going to do it again, right? Because you're going to say, oh, I started walking, but I got shin splints or my knees hurt, right? I mean, I remember when I first started running way back when I turned 30, a million years ago, because I put on a little bit of weight. I got married when I was 28, and then my wife was a good cook, and I put on a little bit of weight here and there, right? And then I started running. I could barely go a quarter mile, then a half mile, and then a mile, and then eventually I was running half marathons. So um, start slow. Physical activity repairs and, and protects your brain by releasing these hormones that are really good for you. When I don't exercise, I force myself to exercise. I sometimes don't want to, but I'll guarantee I always feel better when I'm done. Not because I'm done, but because I, I conquered my, my lethargy, my, my sedentary impulses, right? You know, and you can always find something that you can do. You need to really move about 30 minutes on every day. Exercising increases circulation, which is really good. If you're cold in the winter, what's the best thing to do? Yeah, go to the mall, go for a walk in the mall. You don't have to walk outside. Exercise also reduces anxiety and improves sleep because it, re it, it, it you know, releases those hormones and all those brain chemicals that are very beneficial. It's hard to, be, uh, to, to, to not sleep well after you've had a day where you put in some really good hard exercise, whether it's landscaping, my wife doesn't go outside, so I do all the outside work. She doesn't like dirt. She doesn't like bugs. She doesn't like the heat. Um, she doesn't like worms. So uh, whenever gardens we have, is she buys the plants, and then I do all the labor, and she watches me do it. So that's how it works in our house. 
And physical activity also reduces the risks of diabetes, heart disease, depression, and stroke. So exercise in and of itself is a wonderful thing. And it's something we really need to do every day or the car that we are is just gonna start having flat tires because the tires aren't moving and the seals are gonna wear out and start leaking in your brain because you're not exercising it. So what have you done? What are some ways that you move and get exercise? I walk, we have a trail that my husband built and we uh, can walk the trail. It's a quarter mile and we do that. Excellent. I saw your hand go up. Oh, I ride a bike, a oh, stationary, stationary bike. bike. Excellent. How long do you do that for? I, well, I try to do it um, 20 minutes. Good. That's excellent because that gets your, gets your heart rate up. Because yeah. remember, when you think about exercise, when I think about exercise, I think of one, flexibility, exercises, stretching. Now, we know we get older and what happens to our, all of our joints and everything. Things start hurting. You know, before I play pickleball, before I hike, I stretch. So stretching is one thing to do. Then you need something that raises your heart rate. That's the cardio. You got to get your heart rate up. Walking can get your heart rate up if you're going fast enough. But then you need something that's also going to strengthen your muscles. Like my wife walks a lot, but she has absolutely no upper body strength at all. Zero. And I said, that's because you're not doing some little, you don't have to start with 100 pound weights. You can start with two pound weights, three pound weights. Mm -hmm. But you got to do flexibility, cardio, get your muscles strengthened too. So because they deteriorate. I know when I, I, I got injured, I had a shoulder issue and I had to go through shoulder surgery. Um, and I was out of commission for a couple of months. It's amazing how quickly you lose muscle mass. Even if I have a cold, I had COVID last year and I couldn't exercise for two weeks. When I started my exercise routine up after two weeks, I had lost so much muscle mass. I'm going, wow, two weeks. So you got to keep moving. So let's see what we have, anything that we haven't mentioned. Walking, we talked about dancing. My wife wants us to take uh, uh, ballroom dance lessons. I haven't done that yet. Strength training is really good. You can do that yourself. There's a lot of videos you can get. There's a lot of things available online. And then you can do some type of stretching, Tai Chi or yoga. Does a senior center offer any yes. stretching, yeah. Tai Chi, tai yoga chi. type classes? Yeah. And I bet there's no men in those classes. Excellent, excellent. See, there's men in those classes. It's an option. So ongoing exercise is really important. So let's get into pillar number five, restorative sleep. How many people feel much better the day, the morning after they get a really good night's sleep? I know I do. Restorative sleep is really great. So what can we do to have a better night's sleep? Well, everyone knows they need to avoid caffeine. Some people are much more susceptible to caffeine than others. My wife has to stop having even like a Diet Coke like in the afternoon or it affects her sleep. Doesn't bother me that much, but it bothers her. If you haven't stopped smoking, smoking definitely will impact your sleep. Um, you should not have any nicotine because nicotine raises the heart rate. Mm -hmm. And something people forget about is alcohol. <clears throat> so I know if I have a glass of wine with dinner, I can you know watch a movie and then go to bed and have a good night's sleep. But if I'm at a party, and maybe having two or three glasses of wine during the evening, I don't sleep as well. Because alcohol raises your heart rate and it doesn't allow your brain to go into deep sleep, that REM sleep that your body needs. But restorative sleep is really good because it really washes out all the, brain, all the chemicals in your brain, all the waste products. You really need to sleep to revive the brain and your body. Because you, everyone knows, remember the days when you were younger and had kids, if you had kids? And you didn't get sleep because they were up all the night because they were ill. And then you felt really terrible the next couple of days. So what do you do to sleep better? Any tips from the uh, audience on what you do to sleep better every day? Go, go to bed at the same time every night. Try, try to wake up at relatively the same time. And that's, that's easier to do if you're retired. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know when I was working and I travel a lot on business, so I was pretty much gone Monday through Friday. I wouldn't want to go to bed Friday night or Saturday night. I'd want to stay up and then it would screw me all up because I still would wake up at my regular six o'clock getting up time. So regular going to sleep is really important. What about temperature? 60. 60. That's what I set my thermostat in the winter in the bedroom. And my wife has her own electric blanket. I bought her one of those small electric blankets, right? Not a big one, a small one. And she can turn her side of the bed up until she melts. And I can have the, the room be 60 degrees. So that's important. Cool, cool is important. It's uh, 65 to 67 degrees is what they recommend. What are, what are those other things that you do for a good night's sleep? Eight hours. Eight hours. You try to get that eight hours every night. Every night. Yep. Yep, that's really good. Uh, any other tips? Read. Read before you go to bed. Yeah, take the book with you to bed. It changes your whole genre of things. If you read to the book, it's this new story, and everything else is on the outside. So it helps you get rid of distractions. It helps yeah. you get rid of the things that happen during the day. It yeah. relieves your stress, and that makes you more ready for a good night's sleep. It does, and then you're tired enough to sleep. Because looking at a screen, whether it's a TV screen or an iPad screen or an iPhone screen, is one of the worst things you can do before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. Because the light from that screen affects your brain and stimulates it in a way that doesn't allow you to go to sleep easily. Wow. Now, some people, how many people here can fall asleep in less than a minute? That's my wife. My wife can literally fall asleep in 15 seconds. She's a great napper because of that. You know, she can lay down and, and I can I could have just hiked 15 miles and come home after that and I still can't fall asleep as fast as she can. So uh, let's see what AARP recommends. Get enough sleep, seven to eight hours. Maintain a regular sleep-wake schedule. Expose yourself to outdoor light. We talked about that a little bit before because that resets your brain. So your body is used to when from the days when we spent all of our time, remember? Back in the old days, in the 16, 1700s, go to Old Sturbridge Village, right? They were outside all day long, you know, tending to the sheep, the animals, the crops. So our body is used to going outside and having that sun shining, and that resets our clock, our, our body clock, our circadian rhythm in our body, and it's really important. Now, does your sleep cycle change as you get older? Yes. yes. What have you noticed as you get older with your sleep cycle? Decreases. Hmm? Decreases. Decreases? Mm -hmm. So you sleep less? I only sleep five or six hours. Okay. So you, and that's fine for you? Okay. I mm -hmm. don't know. It's just well, unnatural. you look great to me, so it must be working for you. Are you sure you've had your eyes checked? <laughs> These are brand new lenses I just got. So. And you, you said you have noticed some changes? Wake up early. Hmm? Wake up early. You wake up early. I would love to be able to sleep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm up at 4.35. Oh, 4.35. Well, this time of year, it's getting light at 4.35. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but your, your, your body does change its sleep cycle as you get older. And so we have to be aware of that. Uh, it's okay to change your sleep rhythms, your sleep cycle, but you still need to get restorative sleep every day. Anything else on this slide we haven't yet? Caffeine intake. Sometimes people forget how much caffeine is in other things they drink. If you drink any kind of soda, make sure you read the label. Tea does have caffeine in it, not as much as coffee, about half as much, but it does have ca caffeine in it. Uh, keep pets. <laughs> if your pet likes to jump on you and jump on the bed when they shouldn't be there, maybe they shouldn't be in the bedroom, right? Or they get them a dog bed. Fluids and food three hours before going to bed. Boy, I know my wife, if she drinks a lot of water or something before bed, I mean, she's up every two and a half hours going to the bathroom all night long, right? So I, I try not to have any fluids for a couple hours. Keep smartphones, TV, electronics out of the bedroom. I mean, your phone does have a do not disturb mode, right? You can set it up automatically. So every night, like mine, every night from uh, 1030 to 730 the next morning, it's in do not disturb mode. Now, your favorites can, will still dis can still disturb you. So that would be my kids, things like that will come through, but everybody else doesn't ring. That's really important. I mean, sometimes people have all these news feeds on their phones. You get notifications from 
the new CNN or Hop News like we have in Hopkinton or your local news, make sure you have that so those are shut off at night. The best thing to do with your phone is to move it away or at least make sure it's on do not disturb. The last pillar, number six, is eat right. So eating right has a big impact on your brain. It also has a big impact on your, on your body. So there's really, research has yet to find the perfect diet. But we're going to share some tips. Now, before you go on any type of diet, what should you do? Who should you consult? <laughs> Don't call me up and say, Sam, what do you think of the hot fudge and fried chicken diet I want to go on with bourbon and cigars thrown on the side? No, talk to your health care provider. You'll get their, get their advice. But you need to eat a brain-healthy diet. Less meats and sweets. And that's really hard. Like I said before, I have to hide the cookies in our house. And so what do I do to try to control my sweets? I don't have dessert during the week. I save dessert to the weekend. Same thing with a little bourbon. I'll have a little bourbon on the weekend, but nothing during the week. Because if I have it too regularly, it's too many calories, it's not so good for you, it'll affect my sleep. You can need to consume more fish and seafood. How many people like eating fish? And fish can be all types, right? You can get white fish, you can get salmon. Tonight we're having swordfish. There's a lot of easy recipes. I like cooking a nice piece of cod because you can just basically put a couple spices on it, put a little butter, not too much butter, put it in and bake it, and it's, it's wonderful in 20, 25 minutes. So eating uh, fish is really important. Instead of having high salt, high sugar snacks, eat nuts, unsalted almonds. That's my wife's go-to food. We have them in every vehicle. We have a little Ziploc with some unsalted almonds. Make sure you get the low salt or unsalted, because if you're eating a real high salted ones, you might have a problem with too much salt intake. Grains, I mean, when you buy bread, Read the label. It's amazing how much extra sugar there is in bread. Certain types of bread. You're shaking your head. You, yeah, isn't it crazy? And the, the sodium floors make for a slice. Sometimes 200 milligrams. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'll find um, a bread and I'll be there in the aisle and I'll have the uh, sourdough in one hand and the uh, assumed healthy seven grain bread in the other. I'm reading the labels to see which has least amount of, of, of added sugars and least amount of added salt. Yeah, so you really gotta read the labels. Beans are really good, um, they're less expensive, um, and certain types of oil. We know that we don't wanna uh, eat oil that's high in um, polysaturated fats, such as, um, but unsaturated fats really are the type of oils you should use, such as olive oil and vegetable oils. Trans fats are the bad fats, so make sure you're not cooking with the wrong type of oils. And with leafy green vegetables, don't do what my mother did, which was overcook everything. You know, return, get those leafy green, I mean, we know you, you're sauteing spinach and you know, in 30, 30 seconds it's already done, right? So, but make sure you're not reducing it to uh, nothingness. What about tips? Anyone have tips on what you're doing to eat a brain healthy diet? Try and shop the perimeter of the grocery store. I'm sorry, what was the first part? Try to shop the perimeter of the grocery mm. store. That's where all the good food is. Okay. That you can eat. Okay, like the, that would mean the, uh, the, the vegetables and the fruits. The vegetables, the dairy. Yep. The, yep. Friends. Stay away from the Little exactly. Debbie's cakes and Hostess cupcakes with the <laughs> frosting inside with the chocolate on it. Okay, that's a, that's a good tip. Another tip? Who has another healthy eating tip? Avoid processed foods because they have preservatives in them that are not good for your body. And what's a processed food? Uh, well, any of your um, sweet desserts, uh, even American cheese is a processed cheese. I try to tell my daughter, do not feed that to my grandkids. Mm -hmm. It's processed, you know, American cheese is the worst thing to eat. Um, so, yes, and then anything- and Americans eat way, way too much processed food. It's like one American of our biggest dietary issues in this country, because everyone wants something that's 
packaged in a box right. or in a can that you can just heat up and eat, and that means it's heavily processed. Like mac and cheese. The box of mac and cheese, worst thing in the world, right? I yeah, mean, read the label, too. You'll find and, the sodium. And what she's well, talking about over there, she says shop in the perimeter of the store because that's where all the fresh produce and stuff yeah. is and vegetables and all. Uh, but in those uh, aisles, it's all processed as soda, all kinds of box package stuff. I mean, except for the coffee, of course. <laughs> <laughs> go to, go to the, on the inner aisles, get your coffee. But otherwise... Any other tips? I, I take a shot glass, and every night I sweep two tablespoons of EDO, extra virgin olive oil. Really? Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. It's anti-inflammatory, huh. decreases your... Two yeah. shots of EDO? One, one shot glass, two tablespoons. They recommend okay. on the Mediterranean. <coughs> so okay. Three tablespoons of... Can you repeat that, Daisy? Uh, she she uh, does a shot glass, which is two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Because oh. it's part of the Mediterranean diet. You can put it in a salad. You can do lots of things with olive oil. You know, you don't have to drink it. But just... well, I've heard of people having a shot before they go to bed, but never that type of shot. So that's, <laughs> that's a first, but that's a good tip. You know, it's, all, it's great for your heart, your brain, your inflammation, all of that. So let's see if we have any other tips that we haven't talked about. Kale, spinach, and broccoli. Boy. That's not for you. Those are all green. All green. Okay, so I don't know if they have food dye that you could dye these different colors and you would eat them. Whole berries. I love whole berries. They're very expensive. So I always wait till they're the, you know, buy one, get the second one free, or buy one, get the second one half price. <clears throat> berries, you can also eat frozen berries. They're just as good as uh, uh, fresh berries, or almost as good. Instead of putting a lot of salt and mayonnaise, I have a friend that puts mayonnaise on all of his fresh vegetables. Like you cook broccoli and you put mayonnaise on the broccoli. Yeah, ugh. Use vinegar or lemon or herbs and spices. Uh, salmon and sardines, we kind of killed the fish issue, but I don't like sardines, so we'll eat more salmon. And walnuts and almonds, you can actually add those. So I had ice cream the other day and I sprinkled some wheat germ on it instead of chocolate sauce and put a couple other crunchy things in. It was really, really good. So we, we're getting right to the end. We're running a couple of minutes behind. We've had some really good discussion, but let's just cover a couple of risks or threats to brain health. And then we have one chart on uh, some memory uh, issues that you can help yourself with, um, some tips on how to develop a better memory. Um, but what are some of the risks or threats to brain health? Well, smoking. Anyone in here still smoke? Yeah, boy, smoking is really, nobody smokes anymore. Thank goodness, because that's really terrible. Depression. Depression doubles the risk for dementia. And when you're depressed, you're not engaged. When you're depressed, you're not reaching out. When you're depressed, you're not learning new things. You're not reading new books. You're not going out with your friends. And depression is not a normal part of aging, just like cognitive decline is not a normal part of aging. So if you know of anyone who suffers from depression, see if you can recommend them talking to uh, a trained clinician who might be able to help them with it because life is too short for that person to have depression impact their ability to enjoy their life to their fullest. Certain medications, including antihistamine, sleep aids, and some antidepressants have been shown to increase the risk of dementia. So make sure you're going over your prescription list with your doctor regularly because dementia is not a normal part of aging either. Diabetes. It damages blood vessels throughout your body, including your brain. It also increases the risk of heart disease and increases the risk of memory problems and Alzheimer's. So if you are pre-diabetic, make sure you're doing something to treat that. I mean, in this day and age, with the medications we have for diabetes, there's really no excuse for someone who to have diabetes on unmedicated uh, or unaddressed by a physician. Hearing and vision loss, which is also important because if you're not hearing properly or if you're not seeing properly, you're not stimulating your brain. You're not engaging your brain, so you have a much higher risk of dementia. And then, of course, heart disease, which can read a lead to heart attack or strokes or other issues, and that impacts your body as well as your brain. One last slide, tips for improving memory. 
Establish a routine. How many people, when they come in the house, have a little dish where they put their car keys all the time? Yep. Yep. I have, I've had one in my house. I've been marrying my wife for 42 years. I've had one for 42 years. She's never once put her car keys <laughs> And she can never find her car keys. Half the time, the spare car keys is in her wallet, with, in her pocketbook with the regular car keys. But establish a routine. It's much easier to remember things if you have a place to put your shoes, a place to put your coats, a place to put your keys, a place to put your books when you come home. Paying attention. How many people live in a house, whether it's one floor or two floors, you're going to another room and you're going to go to that room to get a book. And on the way there, you start thinking about all these other things. And what happens when you get to that room? You forgot. Because in order to make a memory, you have to pay attention. Attention drives a memory. I know I, 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 I try to do too many things at once. So I'll go from the first floor to the second floor and I'll go, okay, I'm here. Why am I here? And then I'll start backtracking and in four steps I remember and I go back, right? Then that's actually a good way to determine if you have some cognitive issues because if you never remember why you went there, then you may be having some memory <laughs> issues. But if you finally do remember, then you don't, you're not having memory issues. But paying attention is really important. Avoid multitasking. You know, there's a common myth that we can multitask. We really can't multitask. We can do things maybe really quickly, serially, but you can only do one thing at a time. Take breaks during your day. That will improve your memory. You won't try to drive too many things. I know I try to um, get too many things done. I have a lot of to-do lists, and every once in a while, I'll look up in the morning, and it'll be like, dot, da 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 dot, I have on my list. And I know I can't get them all done. And I, have to, I tell myself, my wife will say, why do you set yourself up for failure? Why do you set yourself in? You're shaking your head. You're probably just the same thing. You know, I have this killer to-do list. And then I can only get done two things because they take me three times as long as I thought. Or that you get sidetracked. So, But if you take breaks and don't try to do too much in a day, that really will help improve your memory. And then the last one is use calendars. You don't need an electronic calendar. My wife uses a paper calendar. I use an electronic calendar, but I have a, on my smartphone, I have um, in the notes field, I have, let's see how many I have right now. I have in notes, I have 70 different folders. Do you have the same thing? Yeah, I have a food folder. So when I'm making a recipe and I'm running out of honey, I put it in my food list. So when I go to the store, I'll have a list already started. I have one for books I want to read. I have ones for shows I want to watch because you're talking to your friends and they say, hey, have you seen this series? And I go, oh, no. I put it down, write it down. I have one for birthday presents for my wife. I have one that's a shared note with my birthday presents. So I share it with my wife and my two kids, right? But use the electronic aids or the uh, paper aids to improve your memory because your brain is for thinking. Maybe you can use some other aids to help it remember. But don't try to remember everything uh, without writing it down. And then let's end, um, we're not gonna go over the slide, but we're gonna watch a little video. So this person is living a healthy lifestyle that supports good brain health. And you could probably get some tips on what you wanna do every day. Every Wednesdays are different, but let's have a look at what a day in the life of a healthy brain might look like. 7 a.m. Ah, you wake naturally, feeling well rested because your brain spent the night organizing experiences, strengthening memories, and power washing all the toxins that built up throughout the day yesterday. 7.30 a.m. Time to tee up a productive day with a healthy breakfast. Think oatmeal, <coughs> berries, and maybe some flax seeds sprinkled on top. Your body gets started converting this to glucose, which will act as fuel for your brain. Breakfast fuels you for the creative projects, hobbies, or work that await you. 12 p.m. You are ready to nourish your brain and body. A lunch with a lean protein, whole grains, nuts, fruits, and vegetables helps to keep your brain and body healthy. 1 p.m. Fresh air is calling. A brisk walk helps digestion and clears the mind for the rest of the day. Regular exercise supports your thinking and memory. 5 p.m. Meet up with friends for dinner. Keeping up social You're connections water is great too. They don't for maintaining a healthy brain. Laughter can even trigger the release of endorphins. 7 p.m. Winding down with meditation or yoga can help with transitioning to bedtime. 
It quiets the day's worth of thoughts that often race through your mind. 10 p.m. It's time to go all in on your bedtime routine. Preparing the same way around the same time every night may support a solid evening of sleep. It's a long day for your brain, giving it everything it needs, including exercise, stimulation, nutrition, and of course, plenty of rest can keep it functioning healthily as you age. <clears throat> so, well, where's my last slide here? Da, da, da. Oh, here we go. So when I used to teach all my sales classes around the country, I used to tell my salespeople, knowledge is not power. Knowledge is poop. <laughs> What's power is using that knowledge to change behavior, to put things in action. So we went over some good tips on how to maintain good brain health and also good body health. We shared a lot of tips from the audience, the attendees. But if you do nothing with that, then nothing's going to change. So pick out one or two things and do them. Who can hold you accountable? There's only one person who can hold you accountable. Yes. You. Yep, I mean, I'm Weight Watchers lifetime because I gained a little bit of weight and then about seven, eight years ago, I lost 30 pounds. And I've kept it off because every month I weigh in. And I'm a very social animal. I don't want the people at Weight Watchers to yell at me because my weight went up. <laughs> so I don't want to get yelled at. So I've kept my weight, my lifetime goal weight, for seven years now because I, I, I follow that regular routine. Because I know I might have some bad days during the month, but I always try to get myself back on track. So pick one or two things that you think you can do to improve your brain health and maintain good body health. Write it down, share it with your spouse, your significant other, and try to hold yourself accountable because knowledge is not power unless you do something about it. And with that, we're done. I thank you today uh, for coming thank to this presentation. Thank you. We're going to stay here for, oh, thank you. I'll clap for you too. Uh, take a set of handouts before you leave. And if you have any last questions, Priscilla and I will be here and come up and, uh, and ask.